Many of us in this room recognize that hotel Bible. Let that sink in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'd encourage you that if you desire to, to support and help that, like I said, it, I'm sorry, like Mr. Shank said, that every dime, every penny goes to printing the scriptures. And, um, man, many of us have been affected by the Gideons and, and been helped in times where we felt like we were at our lowest point. If you desire to, to uh, give to that ministry, we have the baskets back there by the uh, sound room. If you want to write a check, you can write out to Gideon's or Refuge. It doesn't matter because we're going to take that money and just write them a check. Uh, and it's, it's a worthwhile ministry to, uh, to be able to bless uh, because they do. They, they help promote the scriptures everywhere across the world. And Mr. Shank, thank you for coming and giving us your time and your word. Let's give him a round of applause. Maybe we've been in that hotel room and, and we've come to this realization that we're tired of doing life the way that we do life. And a lot of times we'll read scripture, we'll read self-help, uh, self-help books, we'll read a bunch of different things because we, we begin to realize that uh, we may not have a good understanding of morality. In fact, when I say that word morality, uh, we're going to get a lot of different opinions on what morality is. What is right and what is wrong? Some of us have a hard time distinguishing that when it comes to issues that are closely represented to us. And a lot, that's why we have news and, and different reports on whether it's wrong or whether it's right. And we're caught in the middle trying to determine which side of the fence we're going to be on. Some in this room might say, if you're right, then you're a Republican. If you're wrong, you're a Democrat. I'm here to tell you this right now. I'm not going to base my morality on a political party. Ever. When we think of morality, we actually can uh, get a little bit frustrated because that word might be a bad word to us because we come up with this question, why is doing the right thing always the hardest thing to do? I mean, let's just be honest. It's... It's not easy doing the right thing when it's so much easier sliding by doing the wrong things. And isn't it just like the rest of the world when you try your best to do the right thing, it seems like everybody else that's doing the wrong thing is having great success. It's tough. But here's the reason why it's tough. It's because we weigh our morality on the scale of society. Instead of the scale that is based on spirit and truth. Think about this. Just because the world says it's okay doesn't mean it is. In fact, there will be many folks that are in this room right now that have uh, more experience than us. Which is a nice way of saying the older folks can tell you that TV and morality was a lot different when they were growing up than the morality that we face today. Oh, pastor, you're just stepping on toes. It's no big deal. It's okay. Everybody's doing it. Has anybody ever had that phrase spoken back to their parents that I did when I told them, Mom, Dad, it's okay, everybody's doing it. And their response is, well, if they told you to jump off of a bridge, would you do it? (laughs) Only if there's bungee. (laughs) Get it done. And then I'd get grounded. Morality. It's an odd thing when we begin to discuss it. Look at some of these quotes. This will help explain it. One problem with today's culture is that we defend too many rights and ignore too many wrongs. That is an amen right there. Let's look at this next one. This one's a tough one. If you boil it down, just because someone else does the wrong thing, we are not exempt from doing what's right. And we can sit here and agree with this all day. But it's, it's just like the issue of Well, if you don't get caught, then it wasn't wrong. (laughs) In fact, there's times in my life where I've lied to myself and said, don't worry, it's okay. 
We didn't hurt anybody. And the Lord's going, no, it was wrong. We use this example a lot in the church when you owe $20 on your lot bill. You need it. And you're walking down the street following a young lady in a purse. And she's digging in her purse and a $20 bill falls out of her purse. And your automatic response is, praise your name, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have provided the 20th dollarth bill unto thy servant. And what happens is you have a dilemma at this point. You pick up that money and it oh, smells good. Maybe you don't smell it. Let's not smell the money. That's not good. And we don't know where it's been. And you sit there and say, do I give this back? Do I chase it down and give this back? Or do I keep it? And you begin to debate a moral issue. And what's amazing is what we come up with to justify us keeping it. We'll say, Lord, this is a gift from you. She probably doesn't need it. How do you know? And what's funny is doing the right thing is not always fun. Because you have to go give away what you need. Here's your 20. Keep it in your purse next time. <laughs> then you go to God and thanks a lot. Now my life's going to get cut off and the Lord will begin to remind you, I will supply your needs and I don't have to do it in a wrong way. It makes me wonder sometimes even where this morality issue came up. We always debate what is right and wrong, but if we're truly honest with ourselves, we know what's right and wrong. In fact, if you'll go back to the very beginning of creation in Genesis, where God created the world and he created man and woman, there was no morality that was involved because there was perfection. There was oneness between man and God. And God told them, all you need to do is do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they disobeyed, morality was created. Now they know the difference between good and evil, and they must choose. And here we are today. Now what's amazing is we go along this world, and even in our Christian culture, we find that Morality sometimes is self-managed. Well, let me ask you this question. How has self-managed morality worked for us in the past? I'm pretty smart. I know what's good for me and what's bad for me, and I can weigh that out. And next thing you know, you're crying out to God for help. In fact, look at chaos right here. What if you truly did everything you desired? We're in trouble. Yeah, some of y'all remain quiet because I know it's deep in there. Really, the ones that have the most scars can tell you, it almost killed me. My own ruling of what I considered moral or not almost killed me. Therefore, I had to cry out for something greater than me to help me because I'm not good at this. What seems right to me is not what is right unto God. And even though as our culture shifts and changes, the deciding factor of what morality is and is not changes, understand that God's truth has never changed. It is the same yesterday, today, and it'll be the same tomorrow. And so we don't get the opportunity to go to God and say, well, God, I know that you frown upon it, but everybody's doing it. It's not that big a deal anymore. And God says, I'm sorry. I don't weigh morality based off what you guys think it is. I kind of base what morality is off what I created it to be. To be like me. To be holy. And man, when I hear that word, I hope that some of you can relate to this. I grew up in the church. And I had many pastors spitting out, you got to be holy. You got to be holy. You better not mess up. And if you mess up one time, bzz, he'll get you with the lightning. And everything's going to fall apart. And, and, and I know it's this issue of fear that kept me in line with God as if he's a sniper up there with his lightning rifle going, I cannot wait till Travis gets out of line. 
because I'm going to get out of line. Can I get an amen? amen? What I found is that there's this God going, I know the mess you're in. I know the issues in which you battle. And I want to make it easy for you. If you will just surrender to me and listen to me, I will hook you up. And many of us go, yes, hook me up, Lord. And we come to him and he embraces us, even with amongst our darkness and our scars and our issues and our regret and our past. He embraces us and he wipes it clean and says, I love you, I forgive you, my blood covers you, and you are a new creation. And we say, amen. And then he says, let's begin to change. And we go, all right. Wait a second. Will this hurt? And God, who does not lie, goes, mm, yeah, probably. And we say, no, why don't I just stay in this forgiveness aspect? And the Lord says, you've got to let me in. you got to let me have full access to who you are. Yes, even that dark thing in your brain that you think I don't know about, saw it a long time ago. And then we get embarrassed. And the Lord says, I know you better than you know yourself. And I have a way to where I can free you from your bondage. Has anybody else ever been in that situation to where you were upset with the Lord because he began to change you? And he began to pull away something from you that you rather liked. And it hurts and it's frustrating and everybody else is doing it, but he's calling you outside. Seems like he's picking on you. Seems like he's just having a good laugh at your your struggle and your issues. And then as you get through it, there's times I had to go through it. And I was mad at God because I didn't understand what he was doing. But as I got through, I realized, wow, God, you're good. I had no idea that that was holding me back. In fact, I begin to say, thank you, Lord, for your discipline and your rebuke. Even to that point as an adult, realizing how foolish I am, I say to God, if you need to beat me, then get to beating. I know how foolish I am. I know how bullheaded I am. My wife reminds me every day. And I keep telling her to submit, but she won't listen. And Lord, if you need to use the back of your hand to get my attention, then do it. I would rather be rebuked and disciplined by you and understanding your morality than to think I'm doing good but slowly going to hell. Now hear me on this. This is not an acceptance issue with God. God does not go, I'll love you if you're moral. Mm -mm. He loves you no matter what. Can I get an amen? amen? And he will love you forever. Can I get an amen? But here's the reality. He will love you all the way to hell. Now, I know I become a very unpopular pastor when I say this, but this is just my opinion. I don't believe God will send anybody to hell. I believe we choose it. Because in refusing to believe in him and that we need his forgiveness, we have made the choice that we can do it ourselves, and that's where our choices lead us. That's just a reality. So here we go with this battle of morality and and the issue of why is it so hard to do this? Today we're going to look at the book of Zephaniah. That's right, we're getting real at the refuge. I think it took me like 20 times to spell this correctly on my computer. Zephaniah chapter 3. We're going to learn through this entire chapter... That history will repeat itself. How many of you know that history repeats itself? It just does. In fact, young people, can I have your attention real quick? If you're kind of in junior high to high school, why are you bringing the 80s back? You know what I'm saying? Those of us that grew up in the 80s, we don't want that back. It wasn't... Man, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you bring the 90s MC Hammer pants back, I'm done. I'm not wearing those again. All right, that was a side note. Let's get back to, to what this is all about. 
Zephaniah chapter 3, we're going to start with verses 1 through 5. This is what it says. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one, she accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord, she does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions, her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are unprincipled. They are a treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. In these verses, we realize this is kind of speaking to how we are. Think about it. Our society will celebrate the one who gets away with doing the wrong thing and not getting caught. In fact, I find that many times as I'm watching TV, I'm going for the bad guy. Or they're showing that there's really not much difference between what is good and what is evil. Even our structure in place for justice has a bunch of evil faults in it. We do things, our leaders will do things for their own benefit at the cost of others. Even in our churches, priests and pastors have abused their people for their own gain. And we go, where is morality in this? Ladies and gentlemen, if we ever try to find our morality in mankind, We will fall. And the enemy is so good at what he does that he loves patting people on the back. He would much rather pat you on the back and tell you you're doing great as you slowly slip away from God than he would ever try to hit you in the face to get you knocked off. And we're all at risk in this. I'm not trying to step on toes, but if I am, good. Because I would rather the Lord come to me and get my attention and say, Stop! This is a huge issue in your life. I don't care what everybody else says. Case in point. I love music. Love it. And I like hard rock music. I do. And I know, woo, here we go. But there's a specific band that I really enjoy, but the Lord says no more. Because it produces a feeling and an emotion in me that is not of God. All my friends listen to this band. And they'll tell me, have you heard the new CD? And I'm like, no. Why not? The stinking God won't let me. And they're like, are you serious? Really, God's telling you not to listen to this band. Yeah, and it's not, I'm not saying you can't listen to it. It's just for me. Because when I listen to this band, it brings something out of me that is not godly. Does that mean none of you should listen to this band? Yes, because I want to drag you in <laughs> to my pain and suffering in the name of Jesus. I'll use this example, too. This will be extremely fresh. Many of us in this room cannot have one drink. And it's not because you're weak, it's because you're really good at it. It's because you're a professional drinker. Some people go to the bar to have a drink. Others go to the bar to have them all. So... There are others in this room that can have a drink. Well, which one's right? Which one's wrong? I don't know. Why don't you ask God? Because here's the truth. And I know that this can unravel the Christian church. But it is your responsibility to have a relationship with God. Personal relationship. Nobody gets to go before God And say, but I hung out with these people, and God go, oh, cool. Well, if you're good with them, I'm good with you. Come on in. In 
fact, the scripture that tells us there will be many, quote, Christians that go before the Lord and said, we did everything in your name. We went to church. We tithed. We even gave to the Gideons. Where's my key? And Jesus goes, I don't know you. Oh, yeah, you know me. They got my name on the honor roll at the church. I've been a great deacon. I changed all the toilet paper every Sunday. And Jesus goes, man, that's great. I'm glad you did that, but I don't know you. You never let me in. You never let me come into your life and take control of who you are. You never let me discuss things with you. And understand, God is not a God that comes to you and says, you will do this or I'll kill you. Now, some of us had parents like that. God will come to you and say, and this is my experience, he will come to you and say, why are you doing that? And we always try to fool God, right? Travis, why are you doing that? Uh, for your name? Because it helps me help you. And the Lord's like, you don't need that. But I want it. And the Lord says, I understand, but it is destroying you slowly. I want that to sink in. What things in our lives are slowly destroying us? Yes, we may have had some victory over some things that were immediately trying to destroy us. Maybe we have victory over things that we were doing that we were destroying ourselves. But what are the other things in our life? Because let me explain this to you. If we're doing good over here, but we're missing a little bit over here, we're still doing bad. Let me give you the example. Jesus wants it all. But as a popular culture, we like to get away with what we can get away with. We tell Jesus, listen, I'm going to let you have this part of me, and uh, I, think that I think I'll be good there. Is that good? And Jesus goes, no, I want it all. All right, I'm going to give you 40%. I think that's a great ratio. And then Jesus just looks at you and says, it's not how it is. And we go, okay, 50-50. I will go to church twice a month. I will sing the songs. But I want my Saturday nights. Ooh, there's people going, man, was he at this last night? Uh, can, you, can you still smell that? Now, follow me here. I'm not here to tell you. I, I'm so sick and tired of the church telling you what to do and what not to do. It is not the church's job to be your basis of morality. In fact, as a pastor, I've got to spend more time looking at God going, man, you better fix this. I need your help. Now, follow me. The enemy loves to tell you, oh, you're doing good. Don't worry about anything else. When God is going... I have more for you. Walk with me. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it's going to free you up. Remember, Christ says, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. And why is it that we are such an immediate uh, culture? Great, give me that full life right now. And the Lord goes, well, you got to get out of your old one. Oh, but I'm doing good. I'm doing 50% better than I have before. Well, let me ask you this. What would have happened if Jesus only went 50% in? If he went to God and said, okay, I'm only going to go 50% in on this crucifixion thing. I'll let him arrest me. I'll even take the whips, but I am not going to be crucified. You realize we'd all be dead, right? That's like going to the doctor with cancer and the doctor saying, I can take it all. And you go, mm, just take half. I want to keep the other half. I like how it makes me feel. And the doctor says, okay, that is moronic. However, if I leave even a small percentage in, it will rebirth more. It will grow. Therefore, let me take it all. Man, the enemy's good at what he does. But it is time that we go to the Father and say, what would you have me do with my life? You and me, God. Nobody else. You and me. 
I'm responsible for my relationship with you. And if God begins to tell you, hey, don't do this anymore, then let's put forth the best effort we got not to be that anymore. Can I get an amen? Now follow me here. You're going to mess it up. But you're going to get back up. Let me explain this to you. Verses 6 through 8, I'm going to go very fast here. Sometimes we forget what the Lord has already done for us. Verse 6 says, I have destroyed nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted with no one passing through. Their cities are laid waste. They are deserted and empty. Of Jerusalem, I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her. But they, will, but they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day I will stand up to testify, I have decided to assemble the nations to gather the kingdoms and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Have we forgotten what the Lord has done for us? Has the Lord been with you in your darkest moments? He has. And He is full of grace for us. But understand... Just because there is grace and forgiveness does not give us the license to go doing what we think is right. For the ways of man seems right to him, but in the end they lead to death and destruction. Many of us can say, I've lived that. When the Lord says, if you will listen to me, I will help you. In the last part of this scripture... Verse 8, a call for those who hold their convictions. The Lord is telling them, there's going to come a time where I'm done. Where I'm going to draw a line. When I'm going to establish on this earth what is truth and what is not truth. People, I hope you understand this. And like I said, I don't mean to step on toes, but if I am okay, there is a finalization. Many of us long for the day of the Lord. I don't. Because when the Lord lays down that line, it's a done deal. Can I get an amen on that? So that should charge us to do two things. Check ourselves and to love others. The rest of this scripture, I'm going to go very fast because I know we're running out of time. Is 9 through 20. And this is a beautiful part of this scripture. It says, then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. On that day, Jerusalem will not be put to shame. For all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove you from your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove you from all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame, I will gather the exiles, I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time I will gather you, at that time I will bring you home, I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Paraphrase that scripture is simply this. He knows when you're doing what is right even though everybody else is falling apart even though everybody else is is saying it's no big deal he sees you do not think that you have been forgotten because you keep fighting to do the right thing 
Because there is coming a time when it will be separated. When the Lord will bring in those who are obedient and say, here are my people. And the world will go, them? Those people are losers. And God will say, no. They are the obedient. They did what I asked them to do, even though nobody else was. They're the ones that when everybody else was making fun of, they still held true to my morality. They heard my voice and they obeyed it. And I now will restore everything to them in front of you. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, hear this. Verse 20 is so powerful. It is the restoration for obedience. Sometimes I sit there and wonder, why am I working so hard to do the right thing when it seems not to work? It's because the Lord sees. We're a human people. We look for outcome. If I go to my wife and I say, I love you, I expect her to say, I love you too. It would be odd if I went to my wife and went, baby, I love you. And she goes, oh, cool, appreciate it. (laughs) Then I'm going to be like, are you okay? What's wrong? We do that. My thing is this. Remember those moments in your life when you feel the Lord telling you to do something? It might take you out of your comfort zone. Pray for this person. Oh, Lord, I don't really. Just pray for them. But nobody's here. I'm in my car alone. People are going to think I'm talking to myself. Just pray for them. And you pray for them. And nothing changes. Except the Lord goes, you're obedient. Nobody else sees it. But nobody else really matters when it comes to that. For the rest of the world can look at you and say, you're worthless. But if God says, oh no, they are the most valuable, then guess what? You're the most valuable. We have a place here called refuge. Each one of us are a part of it. And I know that there's been times in your life where you might have been a part of another group or meeting place of people who claim to be Christians who are Christians but maybe use the the Lord as a weapon and not as a heart of love here at the refuge we want to accept everybody can I get an amen on that yeah even those people that you have in your mind we want them to come in and even God haters we really want them in here Because we want to fill them up with donuts and coffee. And then we're going to hug them to death. Not small hug, real hug. It's really sad that I have to clarify that here. Because as we love them, they're going to realize this is real. But even though we accept everyone, our morality should not shift. I'm never going to judge you for what you do or do not do. But I'm not going to sit there and base or uh, lighten the truth of the Lord. If you come to me and say, the Lord has called me to uh, steal so that I can relate to stealers. (laughs) Here's what I've heard this. I will say that is not right and I don't call that opinion I'll call that truth because it's pretty easy in the Bible when God says thou shalt not steal (laughs) he made that for all of us can I get an amen Amen. and it's not up for debate can I get an amen Amen. and just because you want to justify to yourself that stealing is right well good luck with that many people in this room would say uh, that's not going to work out well for you But if we are the living example of morality based off what God has told us and not what the world says, now lives will be changed all around us. How come you're not doing what everybody else does? Because it's not for me. I, I believe God doesn't want me doing that. Well, that's dumb. Yeah, I know, but it's between me and God. And I'm not going to mess that up. Because when it's all said and done, I'm going to stand before God. 
Here's a crazy thought, ladies and gentlemen of refuge. You ready? Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, very powerful. This is David going to God and saying, Search me, God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. To paraphrase the scripture, this is what it is. David goes before God, rips his heart open, and says, Is there anything bad in here? If there is, you better get it out. I need you to help me get rid of it, because there's a part of me that likes to hold on to it. And, and it's tough, but man, Lord, I need you to get it out, whatever it takes. In fact, you may have one of those days where everybody is on your nerves. Everybody at work is mean to you. Everybody in traffic cuts you off. You've been cussed out, flipped off, shortchanged, coffee doesn't work, creamer ran out, flat tire, everything is bad. And you get home at night and before you go to sleep, you're like, I hated this day, God. And I can't stand the way those people treated me. However, I need you to look in here. Am I messing up? What do I need to do? Imagine one day. <laughs> this is only God right here. Many years from now, they will talk about this place. I pray it's still in existence after we are gone. But imagine if the world says, oh, refuge people? They are the most moral people on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> Absolutely. Why do they thump you with the Bible all the time? No, they love us right where we are, but man, they don't change who they are for anybody else. They believe in a real God. And then somebody will come up on their walker and be like, I was there when they first started. And believe me, it didn't start with the most moral people. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But that old person will say, but those people kept hearing and believing God, and they became his righteousness. That's who we are, refuge. Let's let God take control of us and be responsible for our relationship with him. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Grab the person of the hand next to you. Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you so much that you're the God of truth. Lord, that we don't have to try to decide for ourselves, Lord, that we can rest in you. For, Father, your spirit will lead us all the days of our lives. Lord, help us hear better. May our first response in life be that of listening to you rather than speaking aloud. Lord, I know personally I need that. Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to impress upon us in a loving and gentle way the things that we need to change. And Lord, give us the strength to do that. For Father, we desire to be more like you. Protect us, Father. Show us. Lord, use us to be the examples of a living God. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone said, amen. amen. Keep going, ladies and gentlemen.